the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I came to cast fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth in one house there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. When you see the south wind blowing, you say, there'll be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your powerful word, for your word of truth, especially that which came through your Son. We give you thanks for that spirit that you sent, that we might come to faith through that word. We pray that you would help us this day by your spirit to know your will through the word. We pray, give us strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've really come and gathered here today from all over the world. We've got people from out of the country, from out of the state, from, from all far reaches. But there are some things that connect us to each other. And that is, as far as I can tell, every one of us has been a kid. And you spent your early years listening to your parents. Now, maybe you listened some or more. Some of you were good kids, some were not. Uh, but the experience may well have been similar regardless. So you learned at an early age how to interpret your parents. They said one thing, but you knew it meant something else. So when your mother said to you, wait until your father gets home, Good news or bad news? That's it. Yeah, now, now, that could be innocently meaning, oh, wait till your dad comes home. But that's not how I ever heard it. <laughs> my, my mother never used it that way. Uh, or how about upon asking a question, you might do something or, or you get your parents' attention, and they said, we'll see. What did that mean? No. no. It meant no. And, and when they said, not now, it meant not ever. So, so we were smart little kids. And regardless of where you came from, this language is the same. Um, I'm not going to ask you, but I, I want to try to bring back the memory of whenever your mother or father said to you, if you ask me one more time, and then fill in the blank. Usually it had to do with food for me. You know, you will never get dessert, you know, uh, or not dessert for a month or something. But nonetheless... Uh, and we got pretty good at interpreting our parents because we lived with them, and we heard those more often than not uh, in the house. Uh, what gets harder is if you have somebody you don't know and they say something to you, like um, a teacher. It's the beginning of the school year. Kids are going to walk in, and, uh, and, and it's going to be time, and a brand-new teacher, and the brand-new teacher, after kind of going through the day, the teacher turns and says to you personally, how would you like to go to the principal's office? Now, I had teachers, actually, where that was an honored thing to do. Did anybody else have that? Bring a note to the principal? Yeah, Kay. So, uh, right, you know, that was, that was it, right, Drew? Uh, and, but not many. More often than not, that was, that was not a good thing. But you don't know. How do you interpret it? So how did you interpret what Jesus said today? I mean, 
When I read the lessons, uh, the one that attracts me, uh, kind of like I'm a, 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 just a suicidal moth going to a flame, I look for the ones that confuse me, the ones that sound odd. And I think there are some really odd things about what Jesus says. I've come to, ca to cast fire, to bring judgment. That's why I'm here. I am waiting to get on to the mission that the Father has given me. I am going to be so good at this. Well, that's not the soft, loving Jesus we sing about and, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus. Suddenly his words sound pretty harsh to us. So I want to reflect for a while what he really has in mind and what he's telling us about this will of the Father and where our hope lies, which is a, a challenge sometimes for us. The disciples of Jesus and all the Jews there in Jerusalem have been waiting for the Messiah. And they waited more than 400 years to even get a prophet. That prophet, John the Baptist, I mean, he is one weird-looking guy, and they, they could identify the fact that this guy is a prophet of God. When he speaks, he is speaking the word of God for them. And, and they, you know, all of Jerusalem and the surrounding territory went out to the Jordan to listen to him. Well, he died. No, he was murdered viciously. So they're up and down in this roller coaster, but, but what does it mean that John was there? Jesus says to some people asking about Elijah, well, are you, maybe you're Elijah. He says, no, Elijah's already been here. Did you miss him? It was John. Well, Elijah comes just before the Messiah, and people have been dying to have the Messiah come. I mean, they, they lived at a, a terrible time. Rome was onerous at times. Um, if, if Rome could figure out what the Jews felt spiritually, they tried to do the opposite. They put images in the temple. They forced them to pay taxes over and above what the, the church donations would be in order to subjugate them. So there was a hope when the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the king would come, then they could break free from Roman uh, you know, occupation. They could become again a nation in the world. They would be like the kingdom of David or Solomon. That's what their hopes were, which makes Jesus' words today even more surprising. They had watched what he did, the miracles, the teaching, the love, the sharing, the raising of the dead, the feeding of 5,000, the stilling of storms. It goes on and on. Everything seemed to be so positive. Why did he get in this? It makes you wonder. I mean, if, if we didn't know anything about Jesus, just saying he's having a bad day. I mean, there's probably, George could tell us what the psychological term for this is, uh, something formal like waking up on the wrong side of the bed or, you know, slept on a rock or something. Really? I mean, you, you listen to what he says. You know, I've come to cast fire. Now, James and John had asked about that. When Samaritan town had rejected Jesus, they said, innocently enough, would you like us to bring down rain of fire uh, on this town? Remember what Jesus said? No. Now he does. Now he says, I've come to cast fire, and it's going to be some judgment on the way things are and what's happening in the society. So the answer now is yes. I have a baptism to undergo. Well, in reality, he already was baptized. I mean, I would expect the disciples listening to Jesus are taken aback or confused, certainly, by what he's saying. He's already been baptized, and it gets worse. Did you think I came to bring peace? Now, I wonder if the disciples understood his question to be rhetorical. I think not. I think they gave an answer. I mean, I, we don't hear a lot of their verbal responses. Peter talks a lot, but the others are along for the ride. I, I, can, I can only visualize this when Jesus says, did you think I came to bring peace? And all the disciples are going, yep, yep, uh-huh. And he says, no, not peace, but division, disunity. Now, you remember in Colossians, Paul describes that mission of Jesus from the Father, not to die, that's the means by which he accomplishes the mission, but to gather all people together as one. So who is this? Why is he telling us that things are, are the opposite of what it seemed like he was called to be doing? 
Why is there going to be division by the one who is known as the Prince of Peace? So when we look at it, Jeremiah text for today, remember the Gospel lesson and the Old Testament lesson are connected. And the Jeremiah text uh, describes all kinds of challenges, and the reality is that God sees far and near. There's no secret places. God knows even the heart. So maybe on the outside you're smiling and, and everything is fine, but on the inside that heart is just going nuts. And God sees that and he knows that. And there are challenges that are going on and divisions in the world already. And why we hope that Jesus had come to bring some peace to end this stuff. Yes and no. So a lady is driving her car, well, okay, a, a person is driving, I don't want to be subjective, uh, chauvinistic about it. A, a person is driving his car, and they're driving along, and finally it starts to knock like a son of a gun, and it's just, you know, and steam coming out of it, and pulls over, uh, and they get out and, uh, and look at it, and they call a tow truck, and a tow truck takes it in uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, um, you know, Toyota place or whatever else it is, uh, and the car dealership in the service department, and the person comes out, and they say, uh, there's no oil in your engine. And the response is, could you put in a quart? Now the guys all caught the humor of that. <laughs> you have just made a molten pile of metal. If you don't have oil in the car, it's not like adding a quart will help. It has solidified as one thing. It is shot. It is ruined. This is not a minor thing that's going on. Jesus comes and tells the truth. The word shines a light on the reality. He doesn't come and say, listen, would you guys just settle down? Stop the fighting. Be nice to each other. Be kind. That's all it's going to take. Just be nicer than the other people in the nations. That'll be the witness. That isn't what Jesus says at all. I had a member back in New York. Uh, her name was Mrs. Ammerman. Uh, and she had a son, Lewis, change of life guy. He always you know, rattled his coins in his pocket during the service. He was an usher. And always stood in the back flipping his coins. Yeah, anyway, bad memory. Uh, anyway, so worst memory, Mrs. Ammerman uh, puts on a pair of uh, slippers uh, from her basement. But she had cut her toenail too close and had cut her toe. And the fungus from the, uh, you know, and next thing you know, she has gangrene. So the doctors say to Mrs. Ammerman, you know what it's going to take. Amputation. This is died. Is this, do you, you smell that? And I did as a pastor sitting across her. She would put her foot up on this little hassock <laughs> between me and her. It was an amazing smell. Anyway, <laughs> Mrs. Ammerman disagreed and said, oh, no, have you got some salve? Could you just... Band-aids were not possible. Uh, gauze on it, not possible. Painful because as that gangrene was uh, spreading up her foot and then up her leg and into her heart, she died. What Jesus is describing is something about death. I mean, that, 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 that's as old as the Bible. If you eat of this, if you ignore my word, if you don't have me as your father in this family, you will die. It may come slowly, but you will die. Marriages, families, church, society, nations. We could see that throughout the history of the Bible. There's Adam and Eve. I mean, can you imagine the, the glowing uh, uh, heart of God as he looks at the two he made and the one out of the rib of the other and their love for each other and how great it was and then to come and find them hiding behind a bush as if he could not see through that bush. What have you done? Well, we wanted to know about good and evil, decide for ourselves. We find your word onerous. We don't believe what it says. They are separated from God and separated from one another. They, they are separated. They may be together outside the garden wall, but, but getting there... You know, well, it wasn't my fault. The woman, you know, she did it. The woman, uh, separated from creation, it wasn't my fault. It was the snake. It's not my fault. That's the nature of sin, where, where we have an excuse. We have some explanation for why this is happening. 
You wonder, well, at least that was just them. Fortunately, there's another generation coming. And what happens to Cain and Abel? Imagine, Cain kills his brother. The first action of human beings apart from that word of God brings death. Not honesty. Oh, I, well, am I my brother's keeper? Do I know where my brother is? His blood cries out from the ground. It gets worse and worse. You know how it is. The ultimate uh, kind of a label and description of what happens with sin is the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. That's all they could think about was evil. Sin does that. It destroys, it breaks, it brings war. You don't have, so you uh, want, and you uh, create wars. That's a challenge for us as the disciples of Christ, watching what's happening in our own society, in our own culture, in our own churches, the division that goes on. Do you want the word at the center or not? That's a question. Do we want that word at the center of our families, of our lives, of our actions at our jobs? That word is going to bring judgment, and we may not want it. We don't want the light of that word shining on what's happening in our lives. So we need something more than just a tweak or two or a little salve for the problems or, or a little stop fighting. We need new things, a new life, a new family, a new creation. And that's what Jesus does. I have a baptism with which to be baptized. He's not talking about his baptism in the River Jordan. He's talking about his death. That will be the foundation. That will be the basis for the new family that he creates and for the hope of forgiveness and healing and peace, which is divine. Peace which surpasses human understanding. Peace that goes beyond just stop fighting with each other. Where there is a unity that comes the way the Father and the Son and the Spirit are united. That's what Jesus prays for in his great priestly prayer. I pray that they might be one as you and I, Father, are one. To be connected to each other, to love another, to be at one with them. So the community is formed. He dies for the sins of the world and the separation. This is, by every nature, foolish to think we could form a community of sinners. Now, those are the only people that can be part of the community. And we begin the liturgy by confessing our sinfulness, that we have not improved this last week, that sin still works to divide us in the community, in our marriages, in our families, in our society. That division is working everywhere against us, and we meet here in the name of Christ beginning with confession, receiving absolution, and sharing the meal. The meal. This one cup represents our unity with disciples around the world. We gather here in the name of Jesus, who has brought us together as sinners, forgiven, joined together in this place. So he creates a new body, a new family. There will be division and it did happen to those disciples. Two against three, three against two, mother-in-law, father-in-law. Uh, it, it, it was a challenge for the disciples. Peter will say, Father, uh, Jesus, uh, we left our families. We left all that we had to come and be with you, to come and follow you. That's okay. You will receive a hundredfold families and spouses and homes because we're creating a new family in the world where the Father is the same for each of us, which will make us brothers and sisters. It's not our efforts, but his work going to the cross. I have come to cast down fire. Not just judgment, but the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because I have more that I want in this community. Each one of you is called to be disciple makers inviting others to come to this place. You remember, uh, uh, probably it's just me, but maybe some of you, um, uh, brought a kid home about dinner time or just a little before, and you went to your mother with the kid standing next to you, and you said, can they stay for dinner? Do you remember the conversation that followed later? Don't you ever 
don't ask me in front of them. I can't say no. In some ways, we are inviting others to come because we know that the meal is not just ours, it is for all people. The forgiveness of sins is for all people in the name of Christ. And so we become, filled with the Holy Spirit, inviters, passing on the invitation for people to live in one place where there is unity, and that is in Christ. That's when what's been going on for give or take a few, 79 generations, our opportunity now and our responsibility like some Olympic game. The race is before us. The cloud of witnesses have gone before us. Now we are to be those witnesses, to forgive generously, to love all people, to invite them to come and meet the one who has died for them. I pray the Lord would bless you and me in our witness by what we say and what we do to invite others to come and join us in the family of God Jesus has brought about. I ask that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. We take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.